tonight we're going to talk about the influence of a book on that mind a book that was written in the 1640s called the Westminster Confession of Faith and larger and shorter catechisms because most Americans in 1776 were either Puritans or Scotch-Irish and all of them committed to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Those that were not Scottish, Scotch-Irish, or Puritan were French Huguenots who were committed to French Confession of Faith. Those that were Swiss and German were committed to the Heidelberg Catechism and the Helvetian Confessions of Faith, all of which present a common understanding of the teaching of the Word of God. And I want to look at the Westminster Standards tonight from the perspective of two verses in Proverbs, two texts. The first is Proverbs twenty-two twenty-eight, which says, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. And then in Proverbs 23, verses 10 and 12, Do not move the ancient landmark or go into the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong. He will plead your case against you. Apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. Now these two proverbs about preserving ancient landmarks have to do with two things. They have to do with the conservation of property and the conservation of a heritage. Now let's look at the law of Moses upon which these two proverbs are based. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 14 and chapter 27 verse 17 and here's what those two texts say. You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark which the ancestors have set in your inheritance which you shall inherit in the land that the Lord your God gives you to possess. Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary mark, landmark, and all the people shall say amen. So there's the law of God upon which these proverbs were based, and this law has a political economic point. Its purpose is the conservation of property in the hands of a family. The Lord subdivided the land of promise, you remember, under Joshua among the various tribes of Israel. With each land allotment, having distinct boundaries. These allotments, sovereignly distributed by the Lord, were to remain in the various tribes and families down through their generations. Therefore, boundary markers or landmarks were sacred, as they should be today. The Mosaic Law calls for universal respect for private property and the right to bequeath and inherit property in the family, and in that type of society, landmarks are essential. Therefore, modern laws and practices that break this law concerning boundary lines include zoning laws, confiscation of property illegally by the civil government, property taxes, inheritance taxes, and many pro-labor and pro-strike laws. But these landmark laws are not only for the preservation of property, but as we're going to look at them tonight, they have as their purpose the conservation and preservation of a heritage. If you'll turn to Hosea chapter 5, verse 10, you see that that's how the later prophets apply the Proverbs. They say, the princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary, a landmark. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. Now, what is the Lord condemning here in the princes of Judah? They're breaking down the barriers between right and wrong, truth and falsehood, Jehovah and Baal. And by doing so, they were encouraging the people of Israel to evil and to apostasy by rejecting their history. These proverbs warn us then against removing the old landmarks of sound doctrine and ethics. Like the teaching and ethics of the Bible reflected in the ancient creeds, like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed, the ancient confessions, like the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Belgic Confession, the Canons of Dort, and the Catechisms, like the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechisms, the Heidelberg Catechism. We must resist and overcome the attempts of our culture to cut itself loose from the past from solid historical precedents and milestones like the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. 
from tried and proven doctrinal guidelines like the Westminster Standards and from the absolute moral standard of biblical law. Today's Western culture has broken down the barriers between right and wrong, truth and falsehood, God and false gods. And to do this is to murder Western civilization. The removal of the old landmarks of history, doctrine, and morals has been the major task and goal of humanistic education, politics, and jurisprudence throughout the 20th century. The old landmarks have been replaced with new relativistic ones. And relativistic landmarks are not landmarks at all. It's like having a landmark made of jello. With the old ones removed and the new ones in place, everything's fluid, nothing certain. Right is wrong, heaven is hell, God is Satan. R.J. Rush Dooney has written, In a world without real and absolute landmarks, every law or landmark that is real and absolute is a criminal offense. This means total warfare against any and every establishment, against all social order. Humanism wants a world where man's wishes are his only landmarks. This would be a world without meaning, no limits, no boundaries, no landmarks, no memory, no means of defining, total meaningless. Marquis de Sade wrote, My neighbor is nothing to me. There is not the slightest relationship between him and myself. He said, this is a world without the old landmarks. By these proverbs, we're commanded not only to resist the removal of the old landmarks, but also to work diligently to maintain them in our generation, in our sons and in our grandsons' generations. We must work to preserve them as the foundation upon which our posterity can build the future. Notice from our text in Deuteronomy and Proverbs that God severely punishes the removal of old landmarks. Politically, economically, historically, doctrinally, ethically, if they said, cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary mark. If someone removes the landmarks of the fatherless, Almighty God himself, their strong redeemer, says the scriptures, will plead their case against them. Therefore, apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. God's omnipotence is engaged for the protection of the old landmarks. And those proud and powerful tyrants in church and state who remove the old landmarks will not only find that they are no match for God's truth, they also set themselves at peril by their evil designs. We're going to talk of tonight about one of those old landmarks which the Reformed Presbyterian Church in the United States was raised up by God to conserve and to preserve. And that is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And as we talk about it, I want to talk about it as a gift of God. I want to talk about it because it is a reflection of what the Bible teaches, the most accurate summary of what the Bible teaches ever penned by men. Biblical Christianity is the purest human expression. We're not setting it up as an idol. We're not setting it up as an icon. We're setting it up as a landmark. So we want the landmark to be clearly identified so that it'll stay in place and be respected by generations to come. The Westminster Confession of Faith and Larger and Shorter Catechisms, written in the late 1640s, still have the spiritual power to transform individuals, families, and entire cultures in the 21st century. As no other book outside the Bible, the Westminster Standards have been informing, inspiring, and transforming people and nations in the West and in the Middle East for over 350 years. Why? Because they take seriously all the facts of the written Word of God and all the facts of reality in human life. They seek to understand everything we need to know about God and the universe in the light of that Word. They look at all of life from the perspective of the God of the Bible, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. And it is for that reason that the Westminster Confession of Faith begins with the question, what is man's chief end? And answers, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. As far as what they were meant to be, the Westminster Standards are peerless. They form a summary of the system of truths taught in the Bible, which everyone ought to believe, whether they're Presbyterian or not, because that system of truths is taught in the Bible. Therefore, these standards comprise our confession of faith. They are, in fact, the most faithful summary of biblical teachings ever written by fallible men. 
They're not on par with the Bible, but they are a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches. As the great John Murray has written in the early part of the 20th century, no creed of the Christian church is comparable to that of Westminster in respect of the skill with which the fruits of 15 centuries of Christian thought have been preserved and at the same time examined anew and clarified in the light of that fuller understanding of God's Word which the Holy Spirit has imparted. This is the reason the Westminster Standards still have an impact on individuals and families and churches and societies. Insofar as they are a faithful exposition and application of the Word of God, they bear the authority and power of the Holy Spirit of God, the author of that Word. They bear a transforming power similar to the saving power of the preaching of the whole counsel of God revealed in the Bible. There was a book written back in 1897 that uh, I wish was still available today. It's a great little book called Addresses Commemorating the Westminster Assembly. Westminster Assembly Celebration, 1647 to 1897. Some great Southern Presbyterians wrote articles here. And uh, much of what I'm going to say the rest of the evening on the Westminster Confession is drawn from articles in this book. I want to impress you with the impact that the Westminster Confession of Faith not only had on people's mind, but had on individual characters and on families and on cultures throughout its history. It can be documented from history that wherever the system of truth of the Westminster Standards has been embraced, it has produced individuals with a noble and distinct type of character. And as we talk about the character produced throughout history by the Westminster Standards, pray that our Calvinism would produce that same noble and distinct type of character in us. Thomas Chalmers, the great Scottish preacher of the early 19th century, observed, wherever there has been most Calvinism, men have been most moral. Consider the superior men and women of the Huguenots of France, the Protestant Dutch of Holland, the Puritans of England, the Covenanters of Scotland, and the Scotch-Irish of Ulster. The distinct, pure, and noble type of character developed among these people has never been surpassed in the history of the world. This character has been marked by a strictness of life and worship which regulates both by the Word of God. This is understandable in the light of the fact that all excellence is marked by strictness. Strictness certainly characterizes everything that truly represents God. Any pretended exposition of the moral nature and claims of God, which is characterized by looseness, by that very fact brands itself as false. The adherents of the Westminster Standards have also been distinguished by intelligence. It is a plain fact of history that Calvinism and ignorance have never dwelt together in unity. Wherever they have met, one or the other has had to quit the field. Those molded by our confessional standards have also been marked by courage. He who believes in an almighty Father who has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass and who through his overruling providence is preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions is made superior to those experiences of life which cause others to quake and fear. Faith in a sovereign God of grace makes a man or a woman a hero. Adherents of the Westminster Standards have also had a high regard for the needs and duties of mankind. Honesty, integrity, and all social and domestic virtues have been developed among them to a degree that is rarely seen in this selfish and grasping world. It is not too much to claim that the Calvinistic peoples have been marked by a love of truth and justice, a devotion to duty and unswerving allegiance to right, a personal uprightness and purity of character, not surpassed by the adherence of any other creed or system. We may with confidence maintain that the world has never known a higher type of stalwart manhood, nor a gentler, purer, or more lovable womanhood, than has prevailed among those peoples into whose hearts and life has entered this Calvinistic creed. The Westminster Standards have had a particularly powerful influence on marriage and family life 
which we don't recognize. We just take everything for granted. One historian has written, home as we conceive it was the creation of the Puritan. Certain it is that the ideal Christian home has been most nearly realized in those places where the influence of the Westminster standards has been most dominant. In all the history of Puritans, there's not an example of divorce. The Reformed faith has constantly emphasized that the Christian family is our first defense organization, political unit, school, judicial system, church, and factory. If you'd like to read two important books on the influence of the Reformed faith on the family in history, there's two that you can get. One is called When Fathers Ruled, Family Life in Reformation Europe. When Fathers Ruled, Family Life in Reformation Europe. And the other is called The Puritan Family by Edmund Morgan. These Westminster Christians perceive more clearly than others the biblical truths that one, the family rather than the individual, is the basic unit upon which church and society are built. Two, the family is of the, uh, of the family of the believer is included in the provisions and promises of God's gracious covenant. Three, the children of believing parents have a place in the church, covenant, and kingdom of God. They have never been content to offer life and salvation to the individual hearer, but have always included in their offer the children whom God has given them. No smaller gospel can adequately express the exceeding riches of redeeming grace. No smaller gospel can perfectly satisfy the need of the human soul. That deep yearning of the soul, the gospel answers with the assurance that as we confidently commit ourselves, so may we commit our children into the arms of redeeming love. This precious feature of our holy religion, the Westminster Standards, clearly expound, and I am not sure, but it is their most distinctive glory. Wherever the Reformed faith, as expressed in the Westminster Standards, has prevailed, Homes and families have been characterized by two features, family discipline and family worship. Such features are indigenous to the Presbyterian soul. And if our old church of the 19th century ever loses her glory, it will be when the fires go out in her family worship. Now that's the impact of the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms on individuals and on families. I want to show you now how it impacted the mind and society and culture of 1776 America. Wherever Presbyterianism has been planted and has been true to her doctrinal standards, she has made a distinct impression upon the face of society. She has never failed to bless the state under whose shield she has dwelt. Along with her emphasis on self-government, family government, and church government, she has emphasized the necessity for representative, limited, constitutional, Christian republicanism as essential to liberty and justice for all. The freest people in the world today must trace their institutions back through England, Scotland, and the Netherlands of the 16th and 17th centuries to the Geneva of Calvin and the England the Scotland and the Netherlands of the 16th and 17th centuries were to their heart's core intensely Calvinistic. They won civil liberty and established responsible governments because Calvinism had made them desire to be free and had fitted them to achieve and enjoy freedom. The Reformed faith instilled self-government and the hatred of tyranny into the hearts that believed it. It was not a general kind of reform faith that had such an impact upon states and nations. It was specifically Presbyterianism which had such an impact. It furnished the people in their ecclesiastical affairs a pure type of representative republicanism. It habituated them to self-government. It trained them to self-restraint. It taught them independence and self-reliance. It developed among them a capacity for leadership and a power of command which served them equally as well adapted to the state as to the church. It stimulated in them a desire for civil liberty. No people accustomed to govern themselves in one sphere could ever become reconciled to an unmixed despotism in another. 
This Christian republicanism in a church governed by elders, elected by the people to represent the law of Christ, the head of the church, also served as the motive and model for civil government, for Christian republicanism with its democratically elected representatives, whose duty it was to administer the nation's constitutional law under the headship of Christ, the ruler of the kings of the earth. In the last century, Bancroft, the historian of the United States, was able to say that Calvinism is the system which for a century and a half assumed the guardianship of liberty for the English-speaking world. Westminster Christians have always stood against all forms of totalitarianism in church and state. In the 16th and 17th centuries, these Reformed Christians stood practically alone in teaching that tyrants were usurpers and were to be resisted and deposed. The Westminster Standards were written to put down ecclesiastical tyranny in the church, represented in Bishop Laud and and his high Anglicanism, with its move toward Rome and civil tyranny, as represented in King Charles I of England, with his theory of the divine right of kings. Between 1640 and 1649, the Presbyterians had done their work. They had overthrown the monarchy, never in the sense in which Charles understood the word to rise again in England. And it's not an exaggeration to say that it was the principles of the Westminster Standards applied and defended by the adherents of those principles which gave birth to the American War of Independence and this American Republic. Here the political principles of Calvinism have been most fully wrought out and their beneficent effects most fully realized. The Scottish settlers in the province of Ulster, Ireland, bore the seeds of that principle, Christian Republicanism, to our own Appalachian ridges and foothills and through there to the south and the west, The Open Bible, the Westminster Confession, and the Shorter Catechism taught them the principle of resistance to kings, and they formed the bone and sinew of the Revolutionary Party that wrought out the independence of the American colonies. So we're trying to document how the Westminster Standard impacted history. Now, how is it going to impact the 21st century? We live in an age of anti-Christianity, an age of intensifying hostility toward Reformed Christianity. The apostasy and bankruptcy of the American culture deepens every day. Western society is affluent, highly specialized, undisciplined, and godless. It is a society becoming more and more hostile to all the claims of Jesus Christ. And to such a society, the Westminster Standards are symbolic of all that is obscure, irrelevant, primitive, and unworthy of modern man. If you don't believe that, just ask a few people. What are we to do? Modify our standards to suit the objections of the modern humanistic world? No. Says Nigel Lee, what we can do is to confess Christ clearly and relevantly to this increasingly hostile society. Our confession of Christ must be clear, however much they hate it. We cannot afford to allow society to misunderstand the claims of Christ with which we are to confront it. And our confession of Christ must be relevant, relevant to the specific needs of the 20th century and of the 21st century man. Nothing clarifies our confession of Christ more effectively and relevantly than the careful exposition and application of the doctrines, principles, laws, and worldview of the Westminster Standards. As an honest study of these standards will show, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms are sufficiently relevant in their content and emphasis to the special problems of men and women in the 21st century. Nigel Lee said our confession of Christ in modern society must without in any way compromising the unchangeable truths of Christianity. Also take account of these characteristics of our our society. Our affluent society must be confronted with the greater affluence of Reformed Christianity to make it realize its own relative poverty. 
Our society's over-specialization must be challenged by reformed Christianity's even greater capacity for detail, yet overriding and unifying life with its worldview. We must confront society's increasing decay with the benevolent discipline, yet perfect freedom of reformed Christianity. And by this rich and relevant manner of confessing Christ, we must show society the irrelevant poverty of its own godless smugness. So in talking about the great, the the roots of the American mind, we cannot neglect the Westminster Confession of Faith. And if there's going to be the same kind of impact upon American culture in our lifetime, that there was in 1776 and before, then there must be the increasingly vigorous and clear and relevant explanation and application on our part of these great standards. And we must manifest the noble and distinct character that those standards have created in the lives of those who really believe them. You say, Joe, you gave a lot of illustrations of the impact of this on changing individuals and families from the 19th century and before. The weakness of your argument seems to be it found in the fact that you didn't mention anything in the 20th century. That you have Presbyterian churches in the 20th century and the 21st century that are not marked by that noble and distinct kind of character whose families are not distinguished by the characteristic that Calvinistic families have always been distinguished by well I'll tell you it proves my point that it's not because of a failure of the Calvinism of the Westminster Confession of Faith it is because in the 20th century we've seen a rejection of those standards by people who profess to believe them. I have in my library a book written by a distinguished, or should I say extinguished Presbyterian preacher. The title of the book is John Calvin versus the Westminster Confession of Faith. And he took a vow saying he believed the Confession of Faith, which he now repudiates. I had in my class, one of my classes, not here, one of my history classes, a young man goes to a Bible-believing church, in quotes. And when we came to the Protestant Reformation, we were talking about John Calvin very innocently. He raised his hand. And he said, but Mr. Moorcraft, our pastor has told us that Calvinism was a cult that is to be rejected. So if we're to get anywhere in our advance in the 21st century, we must get back to our roots. All right, now we've talked about the English Reformation. We've talked about the gifts of the English Reformation to America that shaped her mind in 1776. Those gifts were the Geneva Bible, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms, and Oliver Cromwell. And now we come to another of those roots, and that is the Scottish Reformation and John Knox. In many ways, John Knox and the Scottish Reformation had a greater influence upon the American mind of 1776 than did English Puritanism. Both were influential. The Reformation of Scotland had even a greater influence upon us, largely because of the large number of Scottish and high percentage of Scotch-Irish people that were scattered throughout the 13 colonies. Scotch-Irish people were Calvinists. It's the Irish that were Roman Catholics. You've got to keep those straight. There's a difference between the Scotch-Irish and the Irish. Scot- uh, by the way, and just very quickly, there's no such thing as Scotch-Irish people. That, that's a phrase that's come into our language over the years. We're stuck with it, and that's okay. It leaves the impression that Scotch-Irish people are a blend of Scottish people and Irish people, which is not the case. The Scotch-Irish are those people that lived in Northern Ireland, having migrated there from Scotland, England, 
and France. This Protestant colony was set up back during the times of James I in the early 1600s. He wanted to get rid of the Puritans and get rid of the Covenanters. And he thought if he could get them over on the island of Ireland, he could uh, wouldn't have to worry about them so much. They wouldn't get in his hair. And maybe they could make some money and he could have more taxes. So the Scottish Covenanters and English Puritans and refugees, French Huguenots, went to Northern Ireland by the thousands, tens of thousands, and created a Christian and Reformed culture there. So the Scotch-Irish are Scottish, English, and French. There was very little intermarrying with the pagan and Roman Catholic Irish. And whenever some young Scot Presbyterian did fall for some cute Irish girl, she would have to go through communicants class make a profession of faith, be baptized, and be assimilated into the Reformed culture of Northern Ireland. And so as a result, there was very little intermarriage with uh, Roman Catholic Irish young people that took place. Scotch-Irish left eventually England, uh, 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 Northern Ireland, for the same reason they left Scotland and England, and that was because of tyranny, economic distress, religious persecution, they had all they could take. So eventually they came in the early 1700s by the shiploads to the United States. These were children of the Scottish Reformation. These were devout followers of John Knox and his understanding of, of the Scriptures and how the Scriptures applied to life. They first settled in New England, but New England didn't like these Scotch-Irish Presbyterians. So they moved down through the valleys of Pennsylvania into the valleys of Virginia and started filling up the South, all through the South. Some of them even went as far as Texas and California. So that by 1789, one-third of the three million Americans were Scotch-Irish, one-third. Of the two-thirds that remained, most of them were English Puritans, the rest French Calvinists, German Calvinists, Dutch Calvinists with a few other things sprinkled in among them. So you can see the powerful influence of the Reformed faith in the uh, 1700s, largely because of the Scotch-Irish. The uh, How many of you all think you're of Scotch-Irish descent? That's what I figured. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about John Knox, the, the man that these Scotch-Irish people saw themselves... Uh, followers of. And wherever the Scotch-Irish went all over America, they always built three things. As soon as they possibly could. A church, a school, and a distillery. All right, they were all, they were all followers of John Knox. John Knox, one of my favorite characters. Uh, there's a biography of him called The Thundering Scot. God used him most of his life to advance Reformation in England. And then as an older man, he became a great reformer in Scotland. And God used him to, to make of the Scottish church and the Scottish people through his preaching and teaching a, a Calvinistic and a Presbyterian nation. The Church of England was and is to this day Anglican. The Church of Scotland in the 16th and 17th century was Presbyterian and is to this very day, though its Calvinism has waned. And it's because of the influence of John Knox. I could talk the rest of our time about John Knox, but I only want to point out the five unique contributions of Knox to generations that succeeded him and the five major contributions of John Knox to the thinking of Americans in 1776. But before I do, let me make a distinction between the Scottish Reformation and the English Reformation. They were both important. They were both works of God, but there were some distinctions between the English and the Scottish Reformation in the 16th century. For instance, the English Puritans resisted the Tudors and the Stuarts because they trampled on their individual and local rights as English free men. On the other hand, the Scottish Presbyterians resisted the Tudors and the Stuarts because they trampled on the crown rights of King Jesus and his church. Secondly, the English Puritans were primarily concerned with freedom of conscience in religion. They didn't want to have to follow the dictates of the king. 
While Scottish Presbyterians were primarily concerned with the freedom of the church as a spiritual commonwealth distinct from the civil magistrate. And third, the English Reformation was accomplished from the top down. Reformation in England would go as far as the king would allow it. And so Reformation in England was a top-down thing, whereas Reformation in Scotland was accomplished by the people and was a bottom-up revival. The paramount leader of the Scottish Reformation was John Knox, who died in 1572, about whom one said, as he stood over Knox's coffin, here lies one who neither feared nor flattered any flesh. The key to all of Knox's actions and beliefs was his strict adherence to the revealed will of God in the Bible. This principle transcended any ecumenical or nationalistic concern he may have had. He was a man, says Greaves, whose transcending principle was steadfast loyalty to the word of God, not Scotland. And therein is the first distinguishing contribution of John Knox to the American uh, nation and people. His firm belief in the finality of the authority of the Bible. Now, all of the reformers, Swiss, French, German, Dutch, English, uh, Scottish, all the reformers of the 16th and 17th century believed in the inerrancy and the infallibility of Scripture. They all believed in the comprehensive authority of Holy Scripture. Nobody believed it more consistently and applied it more consistently than John Knox. As I read John Knox, I even believe that John Knox applied the Bible to life and culture more consistently and more comprehensively than did Calvin himself. Knox had a later influence on Calvin as Calvin had an influence on Knox. So he believed in the finality of the Word of God that governs everything. It governs the way an individual and family should live, governs the way God is to be worshipped, and governs the way a state should govern itself. John Knox believed that whatever God commanded the civil magistrate to do in the Old Testament, that's what he commands civil magistrates to do in the 17th century and in the 21st century. That the civil magistrate is to obey God, not man. And it's to base all of his laws upon whatever God has commanded civil magistrates to do in Holy Scripture and to go no farther. A young guy in my class asked me, goes to Bible believing church, why? He said, why did Knox believe that all of the laws of the state should be taken from God's law? Throw me back a little. And uh, I said, well, because they are the laws of God. He said, well, what if uh, an apostle arises today that is inspired of God to bring us new laws and more decrees and legal ordinances? And so I had to uh, talk to him about the completion, the finality of Scripture that we don't add to, we don't take away from. That's Knox's first contribution. Secondly, he believed in the necessity of Christian education. He, he reformed the whole educational system of Scotland, the university system. They recognized that if children were going to get a, a good education, they had to be taught by Protestants, by godly Protestants who would teach them the word of God and teach their subject in the light of the word of God. And so as a result, uh, the, the Presbyterian pastors were to go and visit the various professors regularly and interrogate them to make sure they were teaching what they ought to be teaching. Education was local. It was unique. Knox's understanding of education was unique in that it should not only be Christian in its philosophy and curriculum all the way through universities, and the purpose of education was to put godly men and women out into culture, but it should include boys as well as girls, men as well as women, which was a unique idea in Europe in those days. And as a result, wherever Calvinism has taken root, as we read a while ago, literacy rates have always increased. And ignorance has fled. Ignorance and Calvinism can't live in the same place. And largely because of, of Knox's influence on the American culture, and it's uh, uh, particularly showing us the necessity for Christian education. Thirdly, he, he saw the responsibility of the church 
to care for the poor. The responsibility of the church to care for the poor. And so as a result, he revamped the whole charity outlook of the Scottish churches and families. He understood that it wasn't the purpose of the state to provide health, education, and welfare. He understood that, first of all, it was the responsibility of the individual to take care of himself, and so therefore in Scotland they outlawed begging. You say, why outlaw begging if you have such a compassion for the the, uh, poor? Well, you didn't need to beg in Scotland. If you begged, it was because you were shiftless and you're lazy and you didn't want to work. And if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. He made a difference. Knox made a difference that we don't make in America anymore. And that is the difference between deserving poor and undeserving poor. Some people are poor because of their own sin. They don't deserve help. Others are deserving. They're poor and they're disadvantaged because of various kinds of legitimate handicaps. Also, Knox and the Scottish Reformation define poverty, which we don't do anymore. It all depends on uh, what standard or table you use as to whether you're below the poverty line. Uh, But a poor person in the Bible and in Scotland's day, Knox's day, was somebody who, who, because of legitimate reasons, could not provide himself with the necessities for the survival of life. Couldn't provide himself with food, too old, too sickly. Couldn't provide himself with warmth for the house. And so as a result, Knox saw the responsibility of families and the church to care for the poor and were very faithful at doing so. The greatest influence of Knox upon the American mind of 1776 was his understanding of covenantal politics, his covenantal philosophy of politics. We could also call it his federal philosophy of politics. Because the word federal comes from the Latin word that means covenantal. So when we speak of the federal government in Washington, D.C., we are betraying the influence of John Knox upon the United States. That our founding fathers understood the role of the federal government to be one of covenant keeping. The covenantal government, the federal government in Washington, D.C., And Knox taught that all just and free and prospering uh, magistrates are based upon four covenants, memorize these, and call politicians to account. We have remnants of this in putting your hand on the Bible, uh, elected officials taking an oath, oath of office, swearing to uphold and defend the Constitution. Those are remnants of John Knox. Also, the United States is the last English speaking country in the West to be faithful to one of John Knox's leading. Uh, teachings for politics. It may come, it may end in 2008, but so far we're the last English speaking nation to be faithful to John Knox's political, uh, requirement that heads of state be men. That may change in the next election. But if it doesn't change, let's hope it's not a trained Muslim or a Mormon or liberal or whatever. Anyway. So uh, here are the four covenants upon which a free and just civil magistrate is built. And he gets all these out of the Bible. He gives scripture proofs for all these in the Bible. Number one, the first covenant is between the head of, is between the civil magistrate and God, wherein the civil magistrate promises to rule under the supremacy of God and according to God's law. That's the first covenant. A society, a society is not going to be free and just, and a civil magistrate is not going to enhance freedom and provide justice unless he begins by covenanting and swearing to the Almighty God that he will recognize his superior supremacy, be answerable to his supremacy, and rule in terms of his law. Second covenant. The civil magistrate swears to the citizenry that that magistrate will protect that citizenry in terms of God's law. Third covenant, all these are in the Bible, is a covenant that citizens make with the civil magistrate, and this is Knox's great contribution, that they will pledge their allegiance to that magistrate and be submissive to its authority as long as it keeps its covenants. 
but not one second thereafter. And thirdly, is the covenant the citizens make with God that they will be his faithful Christian people. Now Knox's covenantal view of politics shaped American mind, not as much as it should have, but nevertheless it did. And without these covenants, at the basis, you can't have a free and just civil government. The civil government makes a vow with God to live in terms of his supremacy and to rule in terms of his law. The civil government makes a vow to the people that it will protect them in terms of God's law. The people will make a vow to the civil government that they will pledge their allegiance to that government and be supportive to it as long as it's supportive to its covenants. But anything it does, contrary to its covenants, the people will consider null and void. And fourth, the covenant the people make with God, that they will be a Christian people. So when you pray, uh, when you look at political candidates... Ask them if they believe in Knox's four covenants and then be quiet. See what they say after they... And you don't want a politician. You don't want a civil magistrate that is not a follower of John Knox in this covenant approach to politics. And when you pray and work toward the reconstruction of politics in the United States, think in terms of these four covenants. Now the fifth contribution of John Knox that I think is at the basis of the Declaration of Independence is his doctrine of the legitimacy of resistance against tyrants. The legitimacy of resistance against tyrants. If there was a tyrant who was the head of state or an idolater like Bloody Mary, it is the duty of the lesser magistrates to resist the head of state's tyranny and to overthrow the tyrant and execute him if necessary. If you can turn him out of office by peaceful means, great. If you have to use violence after you've tried everything else, great. But a tyrant, the the, the lesser magistrates have responsibility to resist and overturn tyrants and idolaters who are heads of state. But it can't be a group of people acting like a bunch of vigilantes. Somebody going out here and say, boys, let's go get our guns and go to Washington and start shooting the rascals. Knox was not a revolutionary. He said, you don't use violence until you've used everything else, tried everything else, including longstanding patience. Uh, and he also said that any kind of, of violent resistance to tyranny must be led by civil magistrates, by a a vice president, a speaker of the house, a governor that has the power of the sword, the powers that will be ordained of God, and it's the responsibility of civil magistrates to uh, depose tyrants. He went on to say it is the responsibility of all citizens to depose tyrants and idolaters. And if you refuse to depose tyrants and uh, idolaters, then you become accomplices with them in their crimes. And you suffer under the curse of God. So it was this idea of the legitimacy of legal resistance to tyrants, peaceful if possible, and then the use of arms when not possible if things become that severe. And even then it can't be a vigilante thing. It must be after you've tried everything else and it must be led by a civil magistrate. And that's the basis of the Declaration of Independence. We're going to read the Declaration of Independence one of these two, two or three Sundays evenings. I used to believe it wasn't a Christian document many, many years ago. I quit believing that after I started studying the roots of the American mind of 1776. It wasn't perfect. But it was, it, it was deeply influenced by the Reformed faith and by particularly by John Knox. What's the point of the Declaration of Independence? The King of England has broken his covenant with the colonies and we're no longer accountable to obey our covenants to him. So we declare our independence from him and we establish a new government in his place. And the colonies, it wasn't just a bunch of of Americans getting together and starting shooting the British. Each colony mustered legal militias. 
And those militias accountable to the state from which they come were legal armies led by civil magistrates and the use of force to overturn the tyranny of the king of England in England in the colonies and to put in his place a new government. So they resisted tyranny, even by the force of arms, and you have it right there in the Declaration of Independence. And those are the basic contributions of John Knox. Next week, we'll talk about a, a great historical document that uh, was the model for the Declaration of Independence, and that was the Solemn League and Covenant of 1643 made between England and Scotland. If you don't understand that document, you'll misread the Declaration of Independence. Let us pray. We do thank you, our God, for the Westminster Standards. We thank you for what they've done to us in our history. We pray that you would use them to do it to us again. We thank you for John Knox. May his influence be rediscovered and appreciated. Bless us to maintain the old landmarks for the sake of our children. Amen.